Hello everyone, I hope you can hear me if you are there. Uh, I heard some challenges with setting up what I can see what people are saying. Um, but I can see there's actually one here, so I will wait a few minutes to see who's going to in today's live stream. Okay, so I see we've got a couple of people in the class. Um, thank you for joining. I am Dr. Demi. For those of you who do not know, I curate the A-Level Biology channel. Um, if you have anything you want to say, you can just post it in the chat, but please keep the chat respectful, um, respectful of everyone who might be joining the stream. Today's purpose is simply to um, do a one hour class with some of you. So a class on A level concepts that you might be with. And of course I've chosen Sunday for this because I think first of all, Sunday works for me. I'm very busy. I tend to work Mondays to Saturdays sometimes. So Sundays are the best times. Um, and yeah, that's that's just what works. So by all can, um, post any messages in the chat that you want to post in. I am not sure exactly what students would like me to focus on this morning. So if you could, um, I'm, I'm thinking we're focusing on chapters 12 to 19, which is the A-level syllabus. So if there's any particular chapter, because this is only going to go on for an hour, a 10 minutes past 10 British time, I'm going to minutes past the next hour, I'm stopping. So if there's any particular chapter that is a bit rough that you would like some help with, please just post that in the, in the chat. I'm assuming you have that. Uh, hopefully you do. If you don't have access, I don't know how we're going to do this. And you can see it, and it should be fine. Okay, so it seems as though I'm having the same challenges type in the chat or people can't see anything. So this is a bit of a problem. Oh, there you go. All right. Uh, thank you so much, lovely. Um, yeah. All right. So you can see my messages then, probably just taking some time for you to them. Okay, great. All right. Okay, great. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Let's then just get into it. So 10 minutes past the hour, I will stop. So if there's any particular thing you want me to focus on, or I could just have a past paper question with you. Um, and I will upload the full video of that past paper for students um, to see for those who are members. You would have access, obviously, to like the full videos. For those who are not members, I tend to do shorter videos now that you can you can just watch um on your own um later on all right all right so if there's any particular chapter you can put a chat otherwise i'll open up a question paper and we will have a look at it together um so while i wait for you just open up that paper regardless just in case that's what you would like Okay, from a ways of uh, 
four year of yearly house papers without topical, without topic. Okay, so I'm assuming you're asking me that if you do four years past papers without covering the topics, is that enough to get you an A in biology? Um, the answer to that is no, simply because you need both. And this is something I did with my students. So my students every year for the exams finish the syllabus by June. All right. They finish the syllabus by June, um, not by June, sorry, by March. Um, as a matter of fact, before the end of March. And we spend the time between March and May only doing past papers. So the, the reason I bring that up is that they had the opportunity to first of all cover all the topics. And then when I threw them a question, it helps them re realize what they knew about a certain topic and what they not. So I would not advise you to only focus on just doing the past papers and not covering all, all of the topics. It's, it's important for you to cover key topics, especially for different papers. So, I mean, if you want me, would you guys like me to start a bit instead of just going to a past paper? If you want me to talk about this question thing a bit, I can also do that. So just type yes and no, and maybe to take like five to six minutes discussing this. Let me know what you want. Okay, what to do at this point for May, June 2022? Oh, it seems as though there's a lot of, um, there's a there's a big desire to understand the exam and not necessarily the content, because I guess the content on the channel is enough. All right, so let's get into it then. So first things first, if you want to get an A in biology, this is my big advice for you. You need to section your time. And I mean, like you should have started last month, but it's not too late. You can start now. You need to section your time into weeks. So if you are studying for paper four, and that's the paper that counts the most for your A-level exam overall, I think it counts 38.5%. So if you do well in paper four, you already have a significant chunk of your, of your marks. Um, for paper four, you need to study the important topics. And the very important topics are chapters 16, 17, 18, and 19, those four chapters. So study chapters 16, 17, 18, and 19, um, the last four. They are usually the ones that tend to come first. And most of the time, 17 and 18 altogether would make up up to 20 marks, all right? And you know paper four is 100 marks in total. So if you have 20 out of 100, that's already a fifth of it. So make sure you study that. Make sure you study photosynthesis and respiration because those two are really important. Um, for those asking if I'm going to talk about paper two, no. Um, I just want to talk about paper four for now. And if we have time, I'll cover paper two. But paper two is one of the easiest. So paper four, make sure you study... Um, make sure you study respiration and photosynthesis very closely. Um, make sure you also study homeostasis. Luckily for you, for this year, you don't have to study the hormones and the graphs. Those graphs used to be very confusing. You're not required to know that for 2022. So that's very lucky for you. Um, but make sure you still study all the other aspects of homeostasis, particularly the aspects that speak about the kidneys. Um, the kidneys and how ultrafiltration works and um, the glomerular filtration as well as the, um, what's it called now, reabsorption in the proximal and distal convoluted tubules. So those um, two you have to, you have to make sure you, you talk about, um, you study well. All right. I'm just going to, um, so I'm, because I said I'm talking about a level. I'm just trying to make sure I put that really clearly. Um, okay, so that's for chapter for paper four. So you make sure you study the last four chapters. Make sure you study respiration and photosynthesis very clearly. Um, make sure you also study homeostasis very closely. For the other chapters, I think you can maybe have some wiggle room because the thing I've noticed is that when students understand 
homeostasis, photosynthesis, as well as the last four chapters, this, they tend to be okay, generally. They are not struggling too badly with the other chapters. So, of course, that doesn't mean you shouldn't study the other chapters, but please make sure that you are, you know, focusing on those ones that I've mentioned. The other thing I also want to say is that um, you need to plan your study in a way that when you study a chapter, you go into the past papers and you can read, um, you can solve rather the questions that are related to the chapter. If you can't solve the questions that are related to that chapter, unfortunately, then you might have a problem. Okay, so make sure you study daughters for A level. Um, I'm just going to go back to the chat and see what I missed. I am not going to talk about paper today. So what to do at point for the major in exams? So the best thing that you can do just to answer that question is um, section your time. You need to dedicate weeks. You need to start planning your time in weeks. So I, my students had a tool back then. I can't remember what it's called, but I'm sure if you Google it, you'll be able to find it where they would enter the exam date and the number of chapters they had to study and the software would calculate how many chapters they have to do each week but I'm not sure what the tool is called anymore and my students are now in university so I doubt any of them would be willing to to, to answer that question at this point um, but what you can do at this point is you can start by planning in weeks I always say you should always do if you're preparing for a biology exam and you want to get an A do two hours of biology every day and i know that sounds like a lot but hear me out two hours of biology every day doesn't mean you're sitting there studying the content every single day it means that on monday for example you can say okay i want to study chapters one and two because those chapters are very short and they're very quick so you spend one hour on chapter one just making sure you get everything that goes with it and then another hour on chapter two then you take the next day an hour to do a one Right. You can just do a paper one, chapter one and two. You mustn't get any questions wrong there because you've just studied that. But it will also give you an idea what you're doing with the next few chapters. All right. So the next few chapters that follow, you can be like, oh, OK, um, I'm not that great here. So you know that the next time you are studying for chapters three and four, you have to focus on specific points. And of course, take weekends off. I don't tell students to study on weekends. I don't advise that. So on weekends, don't do anything. Make sure you rest. Make sure you relax your brain. But by all means, try to do those rotations of maybe two hours of studying on a Monday. Monday, one hour of past paper on Tuesday, two hours on Wednesday, one hour of past paper on Thursday. And on Friday, you decide to maybe just pass paper or um, leave things alone. So yeah, that's that. I see someone's asked about CRISPR-9, Cas9 protein. Um, I think I'll explain that in a minute. Said, how many yearly papers are enough for AS bio? Paper two. I see there are a lot of questions on paper two and it's really beginning to um it's i find it interesting that everyone's talking about paper two because it is one of the easiest um one of the easiest papers actually that you can have if you understand paper one paper two is not a problem as a matter of fact paper two is easier than paper one so for students who are worried about that paper two a lot easier than paper one is paper one is the most underestimated paper and it is also the one students tend to do the least well in students tend to do well in a lot of other papers um they do well even in paper four and head to paper one so paper one i would say focus on that if you want to pass paper two same strategy you need to do a lot of past papers at least two past papers from the previous three years from may june from october november as well as from march the march exams are very particular for students who are in india um, that's where march papers seem to be offered so if you know that you want to do really well then by all means um also practice that because i've noticed the march papers are quite difficult um so it seems as though the indian students get it a bit harder but I mean, they also do excellently well. So there's no doubt that they're up to the task. So 
but by all means practice those really difficult papers if you know that you want to do well um, so further your past papers do past papers from the last um, three years um, let me and that applies to the entire exam um, Shoki, thank you so much for that message i see that you appreciate the help for homeschoolers um okay all right which chapters do you need to focus on to secure a B? Okay. So if you want to get a B, uh, well, the B is always my minimum standard for students. And I think by the end of the syllabus, so many of them are tired. They're always like, oh, I don't know if I can get a B. Um, but certainly, they, um, getting a B is not difficult. To get a B, what you need to know is that you need to have 70% overall. Now, the most heartbreaking thing I've seen is that a lot of students get 68 or 69 and it's just one of those things where you like it's just one mark so if you want to get a b i would say your preparation should also be as good as somebody who gets an a so i will spend another five minutes just talking about the tricks before i then go into a past paper or something um <laughs> lovely says there's so much work um lovely don't worry it's not too bad um we will try to get through it together using Sunday classes. So if you want to get um, a B, you have to do the same amount of work as someone who wants to get an A. The only difference there is that you might make more errors than someone who gets an A. And when I mean errors, it means that, for example, if a question is four marks and they say, state the reasons why, um, for example, the glomerular filtration process happens the way that it does. And this is for four marks. Someone who gets a B would only possibly write three points. So they lose one mark there, whereas someone who's gone in for an A would write four points. And those are the differences between people who get A's and B's. And actually that's also the difference between an A and an A star. The idea that people who get an A tend to look at the number of marks and they write in accordance. If the question hasn't stayed, hasn't said state two reasons, it said state reasons, and it's giving you four marks, you have to write four points. If it's giving you two marks, you have to write two points. The other thing is that your points need to be clear, all right? You can't take the same point and then write an essay about it. If you've been told to state two reasons why XXX is happening, then don't, take one reason and say it happens because of this and this and this but because you don't know what the next reason is the second reason you decide for example when do you i mean when you say for example they haven't asked you for an example they've simply said to state the reason so those are the places where people lose marks and that's what makes the difference between a person who gets an a and a b um, and also between a person who gets an a and an a star and obviously those are not things that I penalize students well because it can be really difficult um, when you're sitting in the exam to be able to recall every single thing that you've learned. But I often tell students, don't be too attached to memorizing everything. Rather be attached to understanding the principles that guide everything. Because if you understand the principles under everything, then you are likely to do really well in the exam. If you cram everything, you're likely to not do well because cramming, for A levels is a death sentence. The idea that they might ask you, for example, um, what is terminus or what is the substrate used for respiration? And then you say, oh, it's glucose. What is this? That, that's very rare. Most of the questions require you to think and to apply principles. So make sure you understand the principles behind um, your, your work. Um, I think for things that have to do with AS, I will handle next week um, when I schedule another live. But for today, I really want to just focus on A-levels. So um, I am going to now put in, um, I need to share my screen and I'm going to do, I'm going to try to do a question paper with everyone. That's assuming everyone's okay with the answers. Are you all okay? Okay with how if you have clash of subjects oh that's always a big one we have to um explain plain um okay so i mean i have to 
do because we're doing biology and economics. They had those two subjects on the same day. I don't know how they did it. Most of them were still ill regardless. Um, I had students who got B. Um, I had a couple of, I think the first set of students I taught, there were there were three A stars. And this part is here and there. I think my biggest um, advice is start preparing early so that you're not spending the exam time trying to understand things. You're simply spending the exam time just revising things and going over them and just making sure you understand. Um, that's what's most important. If you are spending the time, if you're waiting too close towards the exam to understand things, then you're in trouble. And um, that's something that I, I don't think that you should you should do. Don't take that risk. That make sure you are prepared beforehand um, and, and like prepared in terms of understanding. And so I would say start studying objects together in your in your exams. Um, let me see. I just want to find a paper and do that will be fun that I perhaps haven't done on the channel yet. Okay, I think I think I've so. Um, I'm just waiting for it to open. Computer is a bit slow over here. But yeah, that's really, um, start preparing now. If you have clashes of papers, make sure that you're studying them together and you have like sectioned hours. You need to be very disciplined with your time if you want to really do well with your A-level exam. Um, you can't afford to be lackadaisical. And something that tells students that they find hard to believe until it comes to the exams is that many of them, many students believe that biology is the easiest science exam, but it's actually not. Biology happens to be the one students tend to fail the most um, because they are underestimating it. So by means, please avoid underestimating biology. Uh, it is actually difficult as your physics exam, if not a bit more difficult, and also as difficult as your chemistry exam. So for those who are taking um, sex chemistry biology, just thought to let you know that. I am waiting for Peter to open this paper. My computer is a bit slow this morning. And I'll just do a couple of questions with you, but I'll upload the full recording for the paper detailed explanations to those who have signed up for memberships. So you'll be able to have um, full access to all solutions for this paper schedule that for tomorrow um or for later this evening so i'll just let you know and for those who are on memberships i will do again a top so last week i did, um a question on i did questions on chapters 18 um this week i think i'll do to 16 questions just so you know 16 questions look like yeah, so I think that my computer is now ready to go. It's just going to open. So for those who are here, I hope you are feeling a bit better. No, maybe I hate it here. Yes, um, Josh, that's a good question. The 2022 paper, I assume, would not be as easy as the 2021 paper. And that's because I've had specimen papers. And the specimen papers are the ones I usually upload for, for um, the ones for the people who have signed up to memberships. So I don't expect it to be easier than 2020. I expect it to have I expected to have a few more tricks here and there that you used to look out for. Um, so solving the specimen papers would very be a very good way for you to be on top of things right now. Um, 
one was easy because again that was the last paper for that syllabus it was also in the thick of the pandemic um, you know it was just a lot easier right now there's for many places the pandemic seems to have ended so the chance that that would be taken into consideration for students outside of the uk and um, for the i would um prepare really hard and not base it on that or not that even when you sort the specimen the specimen papers are easier than the actual paper when the paper comes out so the specimen papers are a bit easy but i've had a look at them of them are not as easy as you would expect um so just make sure you prepare that's the biggest thing i'd say um trying to some reason it's just not okay um all right my pen to open literally that's the only thing that's delaying us at the moment um I think it's coming through. Okay, well, if it doesn't come, let's just, let's see what we can do without it anyway. I'm going to screen. yourselves um to find the exam paper I'm not sure this is it okay um can everyone confirm that you can see this paper four that I am scrolling through right now. Um, let me see. Okay, I think everyone can see this. All right, I am just going to use uh, my electronic pen here and let's try to solve um, one of these questions. Okay, okay. Okay, for some reason I I did not get any confirmation that everybody could see that. Can you all see that? No. Um. Trying to see what's going on exactly. Okay, everyone can see it. All right. So I'm going to share this then. Okay, great. So let's do a past paper because I waste time and I don't want us to spend time going over things that are just to feed your anxiety. Rather, let's try to see what we know about um, this particular section. Um, and then we see. So again, like I said to you guys, this is um, another example of how important it is for you to know um, chapters 17, 18, and 19, because most of the time when you open a paper four paper, they are the first questions that come up, right? So please, by all means, make sure that you um, bear that in mind. Um, sorry, just making sure I, I'm just trying to respond to 
some other comments here on the side, um, on the private chat. So please just give me two seconds to do that. Um, okay. All right, so let's look at this one then. It says here, the, oh gosh, what's going on? It says here, the I.I., I guess that's what you call it. I don't know what that animal is. Dobentonia madagascariensis. Well, just based on this, I can sort of tell that it probably lives in Madagascar. Um, that's probably why it's been named the way it has been. Um, so it's a mammal native to Madagascar. It is active at night and it makes its nest high up in the trees. And it says here they feed on the insect larva in the trunks of trees, right? So again, when you get these kinds of images, at least don't get carried away with them. They don't give you attention at all. Um, I've seen students who have said, oh, you know, if I, if I can just stare at this image enough, I'll get some idea on what to wait expect. Um, that's not true. Please don't spend your time looking at the image. Just focus on what the question is going to ask you. So it says here, um, the International Union for Conservation of Nature categorizes the II as endangered. This means that the II has a very high risk of becoming extinct in the wild. Name the domain to which the II belongs. So if you remember in chapter 17, and this is a chapter I think I will admit as a teacher myself, that I tend to skate over. And the reason for that is not because your teachers are lazy. It's actually because if you know chapter one, chapter 17, this section of chapter 17, I think it's 17 or 18, one of the two, um, this section of that chapter is actually very easy for you to get through because the only three domains that you are required to know for your A-level syllabus is uh, uh, rather you carrier. You're required to know you carrier, you know the prokaryotes. I assume it's called domain name. I can't remember if it's required to know Archaea. All right. So these are the key domains that you have to know. So whatever you're dealing with falls into any of these domains. Now, based on the fact that um based on the fact that you were speaking about something that you know leaves, it has bones, it has vertebrae, it's it's an animal basically. The domain that this would belong to in this case would be the U carrier. Okay. I'm still going to speak about the Cas9 protein and we have time. Um, then let's see, oh, this is why I don't like this pen because it actually follows you when you scroll um, but as well. So I, I I kind of like it and love it. State one reason why the IIs have become endangered. So in this case, what they're asking you to think about is leading to the to the death of animals in their habitat. So you already they haven't given you much information. They just said it's a mammal. It's native to Madagascar. It is active. Like it makes its nest high up in the trees. It feeds on insect insect larvae in the trunks of trees. Um, but it's to state one reason why they may have endangered. So things that lead to the endangerment of animals include things like hunting, being hunted, not necessarily by people, but by other animals. So if this is an animal that eats insects, there's probably a bigger animal that eats it. So um, that's also something that you, you have to just bear in mind that it might have become endangered because of um, hunting, it might have become endangered because of loss of its habitat. So loss of, loss of its habitat in this case would refer to maybe deforestation because it says they make their nests high up in trees. So if places that they live in have their trees being cut down, then in that case they're losing their habitat so they would not be able to survive and that can lead to their extinction or lead to them moving out. Um, 
And I'm just going to answer this question before I look back again to the chat. So suggest ways in which zoos may be able to protect these species from extinction. Well, something that zoos can do, and they do very well, what I remember very um, clearly because from the classroom, is that zoos can do what we call the captive breeding programs. So for those who don't know, I'm just going to write it down here in case you haven't come across the term. Ooh, what kind of pen is that? No, this is what I need. Why is my pet? Sometimes I feel like the strangest things happen to me. Why do I have a highlighter and not a pen? This is the strangest thing. I want a pen. That's so weird. Okay, well, I guess I can type it. My pen's never done that. Anyway. I'm going to write it either way. I refuse to be held or be the hostage of a pen. This is captive breeding. Ha, ah, now you can't say you missed that. So the captive breeding programs are very um, popular in in zoos and what the zoos do is that they basically take the animals and they um they breed them in the zoo so you know the zoo is safe the animals are not being hunted and anything and after a while they release them back into the wild so that's what captive breeding is about the second thing that they can do is that they can do like um what's it called now they can do research on how this animals procreate and how they increase in number and they can also do sperm preservation or egg preservation so that they can make new species during vitro fertilization so those are some of the ways in which they can um, do that so just going to clear the screen um, and i'm going to check the chat um, just to be sure that i am not missing anything oh Did I open with Microsoft Edge and use the pen? So, oh, did you guys not see any of that then? I'm sorry. Uh, I had the assumption that you could see everything. Okay, I will. Uh, let me just open. We have about 30 minutes, so we can still we can still go on. Um, I was under the assumption that you could all see that. Uh, and your pen on Microsoft Edge is actually a lot better. Uh, I don't know why I did not think of that to open with. Microsoft Edge. For those who are members, again, don't stress. I will. Ah, yes, this is actually the best. I don't know why I didn't think of it. Um, for those who are on memberships, please, I will make sure I do a full recording of this paper and share it with you. So, okay, everyone see this now. So if I write here, can you see that? I wonder why my pen stopped functioning um, on the other one, but if you can see it, can I just see a yes, no? So if I write here, captive breeding. Think that's better. Yes, perfect. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, then. Um, 
I'm going to scroll through this paper and just try to find something a bit more engaging because I can see that ah, this is a perfect one. Oh, when I was speaking about the papers you need to focus on, and I missed out on this one. You need to make sure you know your um, coordination because coordination is one of the very, very important chapters that you get in bio. Um, so make sure you know coordination as well, right? Like coordination is super, super important. Um, please, by all means, don't miss out on learning that. Um, just making sure that I have everything I need here to help. All right, let's let's do coordination. I think coordination would be a bit more interesting from my experience in the classroom. Students absolutely hate chapter 17 and 18, and they try to make it with chapter 19, but they end up hating that too. But let's do coordination. All right, good. So it says figure 2.1 shows a diagram of a motor neuron. Does anyone remember what a motor neuron does? Can you put in the chat if you remember what a motor neuron does, what the role of a motor neuron is? What is the role of a motor neuron? Come on. I'm waiting, I'm waiting. Anyone, what does the motor neuron do in coordination? If you guys can't answer this, I don't know what to do. I'll be panicking. Okay, nothing seems to be coming. So I'll just I'll just tell you. The motor neuron is the neuron that is, yes, I can see Shaki has responded. It says conducts nerve impulses from the CNS, um, which is neuron, to the effector muscle or the gland. That is absolutely correct. So in coordination, you have your sensory neuron, which is the neuron that detects when there's a stimulus. So for example, your sensory neurons might be lying very close to your skin. So if someone were to pinch you or pour something hot on you, you feel it through your sensory neuron. Your sensory neuron sends that message through itself to the relay ne um, neuron. The relay neuron then sends um, the message, um, sends it to the relay neuron. The relay neuron is sometimes somewhere in the in the CNS, and the CNS will then send that message back to your muscles to say, oh, something as hot as there, you need to move. So the motor neuron is the one that does that coordination from the CNS back to the effector or to the muscle um, in order to ensure movement. So in this case, what is the structures that are A, B, and C? Does anyone know what A is? This one's very easy. A is super easy, come on. Anyone know what A is? Okay, I'll just put it here. A is the node of Ranvia. Okay, so um, I want you to pay attention to something in this case, and I'm going to point it out just now um, to you all, the node of Ranvia. If you look here, I want you to please take note of, look at where, where A is pointing at, and look at where B is pointing at. When you are doing your bio, exam, please make sure you are paying attention to where the line is touching before you make your decision. I will. I imagine that a number of students might look at these two and say, I don't understand what is the difference. This one is just telling us that it's this distance from here to here, while this one is pointing at that thing. They are two different things. B is actually the axon, all right? B is the axon. Okay, A is the node of Ranvier. The node of Ranvier is are the nodes of Ranvier are the spaces that you find between the myelin sheaths. These are the myelin sheaths. Okay, and B, like I said here, B is um, the axon, and C over here. Does anyone know what C is? I think C is a dead giveaway considering that it has a nucleus. What is C? Okay. So C in this, um, I think the chat might be a bit slower than the stream. 
So just go ahead and put the on surface C here. It is the cell body. All right. So make sure you, you pay attention to those three differences, um, to those two differences rather between A and B. All right. Oh, and here it says, what is the function of the motor neuron? Um, the motor neuron, like we said, it transmits impulses um, from the central nervous system or from the sensory neuron, from the sensory neuron um, to um, the relay neurons. So something else you should know about motor neurons is that you can have a motor neuron that sometimes doesn't necessarily go through a relay neuron. But I think for your level, maybe we should not go over that. But just remember that the point of coordination is from sensory neuron, okay, to relay, and then to motor. And motor neuron is basically the one that then um, goes to the effector, which is usually a muscle. And all of this happens very quickly. So none of this is slow at all. All of this is very fast, all right? So um, that's one thing. Let's look at another one. It says, with reference to figure 2.1, explain the fast transmission of impulses along a motor neuron. So in this case, what do you think is responsible for the fast transmission of impulses along a motor neuron? And it says we need to make reference to figure 2.1. In this case, I don't know if you can see anything in figure 2.1 that exactly stands out to you. What is it about figure 2.1 that you can see here that makes you think, oh, okay, this might be what's what, why it would be a fast um, transmitter of impulses. What is it about figure 2.1 transmit impulses fast? Can anyone just pick up on that? Okay, I see concentrations of ions, overall charge difference. Those are all good responses, but I want, I'm assuming these are responses to the question about what makes um, the neuron transmit impulses fast. And I want you to look again at figure 2.1. And this is a very good example of how biology can be tricky. The question says with reference to figure 2.1. So if you're looking at figure 2.1, what do you think is responsible for it being a fast transmitter of impulses? I need the other students in the class to please participate. Come on. Come on, looking at figure 2.1, I mean, this is this is going to be our question of the day. And I guess next stream, we're not going to start with, oh, what should we be studying and so on. We're just going to get straight into learning um, and discussing any topics that are problematic. Okay, I can see length of neurons, okay. Anything else? Presence of synapses, hmm. Can, do, are there other students in the class? Is Lovely still in class? Is she still there? I'm assuming Lovely's a she. I'm not really sure if I'm accurate, if I'm correct. Okay, so if you look at figure 2.1, one thing that's very clear, first of all, is that it has a myelin sheath. Okay, so the myelin sheath we say is made up of Schwann or Schwann, depending on where you're from, made up of Schwann cells, right? And you remember that whenever you have a myelinated neuron, it's called myelinated neurons. And Shaki, thank you so much for your responses. I would have loved to have you as a student in my, my class because one thing I appreciate about students is when they if, when they attempt to give answers because it shows me that they're really thinking about whatever is happening. Um, so yeah, thanks for that. So I'm just going to correct some of your assumptions. Because the question says with reference to fi figure 2.1, it means 
you must explain based on what you can see in figure 2.1. You can't, you can draw on other knowledge, but you must first look at what you see in figure 2.1. And in figure 2.1, what you see very clearly is that it has a myelin sheath made of swan cells. So you can say the first transmission is due to the fact that the neuron is myelinated. Um, or if you want to expand that, you can say neuron is surrounded by, so I'm not going to write out the full words because I feel like, oh, okay, well, maybe I write for this as well. Neuron is surrounded by um, Schwann cells. Okay. And then you can say that means it is myelinated. That's one thing. Um, you can also then say that whenever you have a myelinated neuron, you only have depolarization at the nodes of Ranvier. So you then that's the second point there to say depolarization only at the nodes of, of Ranvier. So now this is us on our knowledge of biology in reference to what we see. So first thing, first of all, whenever you say, they say with reference to, look at whatever it is you've been given and then use that to build up your answer. So depolarization only, um, only at nodes of Ranvier. Okay, at nodes of Ranvier. And what this means is that if there's depolarization only at the nodes of Ranvier, the impulses in this case will jump. So it means when there's an impulse here, it jumps to the next one. And then the impulse from here jumps to the next one. And that is called saltatory conduction. Saltatory conduction is happens when you have a myelinated neuron. Okay, so you have saltatory conduction happening as well. And I'm thinking, I think I'm missing something else because again, look at the marks here. So they say, look at it, it says explain the fast transmission of impulses along a motor neuron. Um, and it's four marks. So this is for those who are asking what makes the difference between an A and a B. This is where the difference would be, because as far as we've, we're concerned, we have answered this question to the best of our ability. We've said, well, um, the neuron is myelinated, or actually that's that's actually our first point. So we've done four points. It's a myelinated neuron. It's surrounded by Schwann cells. For that reason, depolarization only occurs at the nodes of Ravia, and that means saltatory conduction, which means impulses um, jump from one node to the other. So I'm just going to write impulses jump over here. So impulses jump. From one note to the other. And then that's basically it. That gives you four marks. So that's just to draw your attention to the fact that if you do not um, give the number of points in relation to the number of marks, then you might have a problem. So I'm just looking, I just want to see what else might be a thing here. So if the if the impulse, if the depolarization is only happening at the nodes of Ramvia, something else that you might want to make mention to is that um, that means that you have local circuits being generated and mark as well. Um, local circuits being generated generated and um, yeah you have solving conduction so what I want to say here also is I've looked at the guidance for markers for people who are marking CIE papers for 2022 and one of the things that have been put there is that for questions like explain you are not required to write it the way I've done I used to advise my students to always write the way I've just written so that their points are clear and straightforward when they say explain, you're sort of writing a little short paragraph. But one thing you must do is that in this short paragraph, make sure that all the key points you want to mention are in the paragraph, because here's what the markers have been told. They've been told that going forward, they have to read the entire answer. And when they read the entire answer, if there is any part of that answer that does not work with what they should 
uh, with what the other answers are saying. So let's say, for example, here, we said, okay, uh, motor neurons are myelinated neurons. They are surrounded by Schwann cells. And then we say, instead of saying depolarization only occurs at the nodes of Ramvier, we said depolarization occurs along the entire axon. And then we go on and say saltatory conduction. In this case, they are required to read the whole thing and give you marks based on whether or not all your answers go together. If your answers are contradicting each other, because if you had said depolarization occurs at long the length of the entire, um, of the entire, um, what's it called? Depolarization along the length of the entire axon, that already is a contradiction to what you're trying to say when you say it's a myelinated neuron. And so that might cause you to lose marks. So your answer must be coherent and everything must make sense. You can't put in things that are contradictory to each other simply because you're trying to fill up the space. So please bear that in mind when you are answering um, your questions in your exams. All right. Um, I hope that that has full. Let me see if there are any comments. Um, so there's a question here. It says, um, what if I had a point where the examiner take the best answers? So in this case, as long again as your extra points do not contradict whatever it is that you're saying. So you can put in seven points. As a matter of fact, if I were to check the mark scheme for this particular question, I'm pretty sure that there are about seven different points that are possible. Um, you can put in up to seven. But well, the point is every single one of them must be correct for that question. So you can't put in things, for example, like the synapses, because there are no synapses in that figure in figure 2.1. In figure 2.1, let me just quickly draw what the synapse would look like for you. So neuron, okay? This is what just a neuron, it's not a synapse. Um, a synapse would mean that there is another neuron that looks like a ghost. These neurons look like things that you see in like Scooby-Doo movies. Um, that looks like a ghost that's also going all the way along here. That's what, so the space between the two of them is what you refer to as a synapse. All right, so if you were to put that in there um, as part of your answer, you will be wrong because there is no synapse, okay? So you have that in mind. All right. Um, I think I'm just going to to end here now. For those of you who have not subscribed to my channel, it's um, Cambridge A Level Biology with Dr. Demi. So if you want to check it out, make sure you um, please do so. It has everything from chapter one to chapter nineteen that you need to know for your AS and A Level Biology examination, and also. Um, I'm going to be doing this. I'm going to try to do this um, live classes on Sundays. This was the first one in preparation for the exams. And so we spent a bit of time discussing, you know, what, you, what do you need to do? What do you need to know? But going forward, we're not going to do that. And I'm going to find a better streaming software um, so that I can make sure that this works without any problems at all uh, for students who who, especially for students who have signed up to memberships. But if you're on the membership, please don't stress. I'm going to record all the answers to this video, um, to this paper in a video and upload it on YouTube so that you're able to, um, to follow it and just check how well you do. But here's my suggestion. Before you go and watch the video, how about you try the paper? This is the specimen paper four for 2022. So why don't you attempt that paper and then watch the video and see how well you've done and also get clarity on whatever it is, especially if you've answered the questions from whatever you've crammed, try to get some understanding on the explanations behind the questions, because that's what I do when I solve a past paper. I go into very detailed explanations um, for it. So please um, sort of um, consider doing that. So for those who are not on memberships, this is also an invitation to please, please join memberships. It's very helpful. Um, you find a lot of more extra content and yeah, those are things that are helpful. Something else I want to ask, if you guys are willing for me to do um, a short video or a series of short videos on careers you can do in biology, please just put yes or no in the chat. Um, 
so that I know, because I know for most people, they usually say, I feel like I can only be a doctor or a nurse or something. Um, so if you want to, if you'd like me to just um, share some ideas, you can also put that in the chat. So I'm just going to, we have only three minutes left before the end of the live. So I'm just going to wait a bit and see if there are any comments, questions, requests. And someone made a request about Cas9. I'm going to do Cas9 videos. Um, okay, yeah. So I'm um, Shaki. Yes, please for A level. Um, is that like revision videos for A level? What exactly for A level? Is that in response to careers? What exactly? Please just specify. Um, so just going to give you an additional two minutes before I go off. And I hope this was at least a little bit helpful. I know we spent a bit of time um, discussing other things such as how do you study and how do you prepare and so on. But I hope you found this helpful. Shots for questions. All right, I see. Okay. All right, you can do that. I do have some cards. Um, that I think might be helpful for answering questions. Okay, similar to the AS, it's perfect. We can do that. That's absolutely fine. Um, I think I'll just go dig up my cue cards and then we can work in those. All right, then. Um, okay, I see people are dropping off the stream. Um, would you recommend taking an exemption for the practicals? So I haven't had any students take exemptions for practicals. Most of them just did the practicals. If you have had significant challenges during the past year and been unable to be to work in your school lab, perhaps because of COVID or something, then I guess that's a good reason to take an exemption. Other than that, if you don't have such a challenge, then I'll say do it. Um, it's it does, um, it helps. Um, I see some people say there's no join button and I've, I've realized that for some people you, you need to use a VPN, which is quite distressing, but there are some free ones, I think, um, free VPNs that you can use in order to access the channel um, to be able to access the join button. So maybe if you were to put your location as the UK or Malaysia, I know Malaysia is there, I think India is also there. Um, for people who can join, then perhaps that would be helpful. For South Africa is there. Yeah, South Africa. Um, so please try a VPN. I'm really sorry about that. I wasn't informed about it before we decided to add the memberships. Um, it, it's something that only came to light after when students started complaining. So I apologize for that, but you will not be disadvantaged. Um, I will, by all means, do short videos um, for those who are not on memberships. So a question about IGCSE. Um, well, I mean, with IGCSE, I wouldn't, I think in order to get a nine, then again, same tips, just work as hard as you can. The reason I often say this to students, and I'll just take an extra minute here because I have to go very soon. I often tell students to work as hard as they can for the exams, because even if you work really hard sometimes, you might, and you work hard for an A star, you might land on a B. Um, so if you want to get a certain grade, work harder than what that grade requires. Um, that's my advice. Work harder than the grade requires because, again, you can make some very small mistakes here and there that cause you to lose marks. You lose one point here, one point there, one point there. And before you know it, you can't really get your dream, um, your dream grade. So work harder than the grade you're aiming for is my is my biggest answer. All right, everyone, thank you all so much for joining the live. I appreciate it. And I have to go. It's a beautiful Sunday here in Cambridge. So yeah, have fun, everybody. Goodbye.